Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm clearly not Mark Miller, uh, but uh, okay. So we have about 25 minutes to get through a lot of. Um, so I imagine this is the only talk that you're going to have on health economics here. Um, so let me see if I can work this. Okay. So uh, I don't know if this shows up on the Moodle board, but anyway, I'll just do it right here. Uh, this kind of evaluation, as some of you may be familiar, maybe all of you are familiar, is really around this idea of how much how much you can buy. You have limited resources and how much you can really buy for those resources. So how many years of healthy life could a million dollars buy? Um, it could be a hundred, it could be a thousand, it could be ten thousand, it could be one to more than a hundred thousand. What do you think is the answer? Anyone for a hundred? Thousand? Thousand is a lot for a million dollars. A hundred? Ten thousand? There's no takers for anything. The last one seems the safest, right? It's a wide range, one to a hundred thousand. So actually that's, uh, that's probably true. It all depends on what the intervention is. So you can, you can go, you can buy very little health or you can buy a lot of health, um, for the same amount of money. So the history of this goes back to, uh, uh, a 1993 World Development Report and the World Development Reports are put out by the World Bank. Uh, and the 1993 one was, uh, was called Investing in Health. It was the first World Bank report to talk about investing in health. And the whole premise here is that, Countries could invest in health and get wealthier. Before that, the prevailing paradigm has always been that if you want to get, uh, if you want to get healthy, you have to get wealthy first. So only rich countries can afford to be healthy. And this sort of turned that entire idea on its head. It was, you know, today we take this for granted. We have, you know, Gavi, Global Fund and all that. But back then, this was not the case. And in fact, it was so influential that Bill Gates, um, you know, basically said every day screamed out that this is really, the, you know, that every uh, human life was not being valued in the world at large. And he's attributed this one report to being uh, one of the main reasons why he decided to give his money to health, uh, as opposed to many other things, because he thought there was a lot that you could actually do in the health space, uh, because it was really uh, so to use a word that, which was introduced at the time, very cost effective. We'd had this idea of cost effectiveness before, but it really sort of was uh, what was really formalized during uh, the World De Development Report and the Disease Control Priorities Project, the first edition. The second edition came out in about 2006. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it. And the third edition uh, was uh, a few years ago. And in fact, the, it's a nine volume set, in fact, uh, of, all, you know, this, uh, it's really like an encyclopedia of global health. Uh, I would not suggest buying it, but every one of these chapters is available online for free. So uh, if you go to the DCP website, you can download any chapter that you want. You'd probably be interested in in volume two, but, uh, you know, any of these are, many of them do cover vaccines. So the best health in interventions, if you really think about it, they may target, me, and all this follows on the previous talk and, and is consistent with those ideas. Um, you want to target major cause of death, disability, and illness. You have to have make sure the interventions are cost effective, which means you're buying a lot of health for the money, and you can scale them up easily. So if it's not scalable, it really doesn't matter if you can only you know do it a little bit. So uh, the objective here is to provide information on the price of buying health. So think of this as the same way for a policymaker as you're going into the supermarket. There's lots of different things you can buy to feed your family. You know. What it's not like you buy the only the cheapest thing, but you're certainly sensitive to the price. So today, if avocados are much more expensive, you're probably going to buy fewer of the avocados and more of something else, right? So uh, policymakers can combine this information with other considerations to determine how best to improve health. I don't think economic evaluations on their own are sufficient to determine whether you want investment in intervention. It's only one of the considerations to determine whether you want to do it. When we did this for the Disease Control Priorities Project, the, the, the second edition, which came out in 2006, um, we had looked at about 260 interventions covering a range of things in, in low and middle income countries uh, to look at, you know, what the target population was, uh, whether the intervention was population versus personal, 
what the avertible the, uh, the the burden of the underlying condition measured in Daly's uh, metric, which I'll talk about in just a second, and also what the cost effectiveness was. So these ranges were really of how much health you could buy for a million dollars invested. And we did this for, you know, many, many interventions, you know, whether it's depression or diarrheal disease or alcohol misuse, all of these, uh, because, you know, people are not just looking at vaccines by themselves. They're looking at vaccines relative to many other things that they can spend their money on. And so it's not sufficient to just say, well, this vaccine uh, compared to the, uh, the other vaccine is cost effective. They might be comparing it against heart disease or, you know, interventions against diarrheal disease. So when we're looking at what you're buying for the money, you really are measuring health. But how do you measure health? So there are two measures of health. One are, uh, you know, what are called, you know, uh, so the, so imagine, so there's uh, at age zero, there's a hundred percent of people surviving. And then over a period of time, you know, this, uh, there are only a few survivors by the time you get to a hundred. And this is what that population survival curve looks like. But that's mortality. If you look at morbidity, which is what that gray indicates, you're going to have a few years lived in ill health, whether it is, uh, you know, it's typically focused around childhood where you have a lot of ill health, then not so much in, in sort of adolescence and, and middle age. And then at the older ages, again, you have more of the ill health. So you divide each lifetime into a part that's lived in full health, that's A, and a part that's lived in less than full health, that's B. Okay. So the other way of doing this is also that you can look at health expectancies, which is you look at full health as being one. So that's, that's really the maximum. This, that's disability uh, adjusted life expectancy. Or you can have health gaps, which is the C plus G of B. So in each case, I can either look at what you're getting with full health and then, you know, the part that's a morbidity, or I can look at the other side, which is what you missed out and 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 the GFP. In some sense, they're equivalent if you do it exactly the same way. But quality type metrics do one thing, um, and daily type metrics do the other sort of thing. So this so one is equivalent to death in the health gap measures and the health expectancy measures. Full health is equal to one. So it's really whether you're looking at health or look at disability. So as Daly suggests, disability adjusted life years. One year of not living or premature mortality counts as one. Let's say you lived a year in some amount of disability. So let's say you were, um, you know, you were down with, uh, with liver disease for the entire year. Then it's not as bad as dying, but it's still pretty bad. So then, you know, the DALI measure there would be say 0.3, for instance. So you so you, you, you can, you're able to add years lived in, in morbidity as well as years lost due to premature mortality. And that gives you a disability or just life years. So qualities is the opposite. You're looking at things which are living in full health, and then, you know, you have some measure of, of the years lived in disability. So daily adjusted life years is, is more common these days, although, you know, Europe tends to use a lot more of the quality adjusted life years. Uh, it's just a way of quantifying burden of disease and disability in populations. It allows morbidity and mortality to be expressed in a single measure. Okay, that's the main benefit of these measures. You're able to lump in mortality and morbidity into a single measure. And there's a value attached to a particular disease rather than the health status. So a year with malaria, you know, is the, so you're looking at diseases because it's easier to sort of quantify disability just with disease because you're able to measure the number of people with disease. The health status is is a different way of measuring things. So in Europe, the way they do it, you know, for a lot of cost effectiveness analyses are uh, they look at, say, a year lived without requiring any assistance from anyone. So it's not paying attention to a disease state. It's paying attention to a health state. So perfect health is when you're able to do everything by yourself. The worst health state is when you need a caregiver for pretty much everything that you need in life. And then, you know, life is somewhere in between. So states of health are assigned a disability weight from zero, which is perfect health, to one, which is death. Okay, that's basically it. And DALIs are obtained, as I said, measuring the number of years lived in that health state and added to the years of life, uh, years lost due to death. Now, what are we looking for? We're looking for two kinds of things, looking at current coverage and looking at cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is how much you're spending to get a certain amount of health or, or reduce a certain number of DALIs. And if you have current coverage being high and cost effectiveness is high, those are the cost effectiveness interventions that are that are used widely and that's fine. 
where the current coverage is low and cost effectiveness is low, you really don't want to uh, increase the coverage of those because it's any in any way inefficient to use those. Here you have things which are very cost effective, but you're not using very much and you want to, uh, sorry, uh, and you're not using very much. These are neglected opportunities. And here are things where the cost effectiveness is low and you're using the intervention a lot. And these are interventions to reconsider. So this is just a broad sort of you know thought process and how one, one might use this kind of information. And you also look at burden of disease and the cost effectiveness. So all of these are important considerations. So you might have a low burden of disease and also not a very cost effective. In this particular case, I said an Ebola vaccine outside of Africa might not be very cost effective. You don't really you know avert a lot of disease that way. And a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the burden of disease is high and it's also very cost effective. Now, you have in between these sorts of things, the DPT-3, the burden of disease is actually quite low. And here you have a burden of disease being high and it's, in, you know, it's pretty cost effective. So all of these sort of give you pretty commonsensical ways of thinking about how you want to scale up an intervention or even scale down an intervention. So why evaluate vaccines? What benefits do vaccines have? So obviously they improve health, they reduce long-term spending, they produce value for money, but what really determines the value of the vaccine? So the rest of the talk is really around how one might go about doing this. Now, before we do that, you also want to think about whose perspective is it? Who's spending the money? Who's actually gaining? It could be from an individual's perspective. So let's say I'm paying out of pocket for a vaccine and I get the health benefits then it's really from my individual perspective or a patient perspective. It could be from a payer perspective. So it's not from my perspective. It's really from the perspective of the health insurance company who's paying, and then they get some kind of a benefit. They might not capture all of the benefits, for instance. So, for instance, when I'm looking at my individual benefit, some of the reduced benefits, so some of the benefits of reducing transmission to other people might not form part of my metric, right? So I only care about my improved health. So I'm missing that entire piece. Similarly, a payer might also miss the transmission reduction benefits. Why? Because they only account for some part of the population. The disease gets spread to other people and other people are paying for that. So they might not necessarily account for all of it. The societal benefit is the most common where everybody, everybody's well-being is taken into consideration. And then you look at whether the vaccine is worth doing from that perspective. And studies look at various sorts of things. So, you know, in some places they look at only societal societal and payer or just healthcare sector or healthcare payer. So there's not one right answer. The answer depends on who is paying and who wants to know the answer. So it all depends on perspective. So the cost effectiveness is actually simple. I'm not getting into, you know, how to do these things because that's, you know, that's usually uh, another entire ad back course, which you don't want to get into, but it's a fairly straightforward thing. It's really how much health you buy and how much you're putting into it. But is health the only thing we are concerned about? In fact, if you look at the underlying sort of legislation for, say, Medicare or Medicaid in the U.S. or, uh, say, the National Health Service in the U.K., they say nothing about health. The motivation for setting up these were not was not really about health. It was really about financial risk protection. So what they talk about is the fact that what they want to protect you from, or if you happen to live in those countries, is from financial impoverishment at times of ill health. Okay, we, we in the public health community tend to think just about health, but that's not really why society generally tends to pay for health. They don't want people to fall into poverty for that reason, and that's usually the argument also for universal health coverage. And this is important because that aspect is not really part of the original cost effectiveness. When you see most cost effectiveness studies, it's not even going to talk about that. But when you really think about how to do it that way, then you really want to pay attention to the financial consequences of illness. And you have to remember that ill health in many countries in the world is the number one reason why people fall into poverty. So people, 40% of people who go below the poverty line in any given year in India, for instance, do so because of catastrophic health expenditures. And if you think of poverty as being what you're concerned about, then you have to pay attention to what the impact is there. So, um, there are measures of financial risk protection, which are, you know, things like catastrophic health expenditures due to out-of-pocket payments, uh, you know, overshoot of catastrophic payments, like how much of your income it would constitute, uh, how much impoverishment there happens because of it, and how much there's a poverty consequence. And, and many of these are going to vary across groups, disease burden, treatment options, healthcare access, costs, insurance, 
across, say, income groups, for instance, or geographically and so forth. And it's important to capture all of these as possible. And all of these were not captured in the original cost effectiveness, like the ones I showed you from the disease control priorities projects. So when we did the disease control priorities project, the third version of it, the nine volume set, um, it literally is this big. Uh, we introduced a concept called extended cost effectiveness. So what was this? So I'm going to just take a couple of minutes to explain this because you all deal with this in your day-to-day -day lives. How many of you have ever bought insurance for anything? You have not bought insurance for anything? Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's anyone in the room who's not bought insurance, right? Either for health or for your automobile or for your house or something or the other. What's really going on when you buy insurance? Why do you buy insurance? Why? There's a risk. And there's a risk that something bad will happen and you don't want to be in that bad situation. So think of two scenarios. You're given $50. In the uncertain scenario, you get a coin flip and you either get $100 or you get nothing. Okay? Very simple. You get $100 or you get nothing. Or I give you $50 with certainty. Right? Now, there's a chance you might get the $100. So why go with the $50 with certainty? How many of you would pick the $50 with certainty? How many of you would pick the coin toss? It's okay. We have some gamblers in the room. That's all right. <laughs> okay, the people who pick the $50 with certainty are what we call people who are risk averse. The people who pick the coin toss are the people who are risk loving. And how many people are indifferent between the two? I don't care. One or the other is fine. Okay, there's one person in the back there, and you say, okay, I don't really care. That person is risk neutral. So, because equivalently, mathematically, they're the same thing. So, if you're a rationalist, you think, okay, they're both exactly the same thing. So, the person is called risk averse if they would take the certain payment. They would be called risk neutral if they're indifferent between the bet and a certain $50 payment or the risk-loving, or the risk-seeking, if they actually would accept the bet, right? So I'm not going to get into the, to, you know, don't worry about these complex figures, but just I'm trying to, going to try to explain this in a very simple way. Now, all of us have a certain utility, which means when we get money, we get a certain amount of satisfaction that's out of these. Now, a risk-averse individual, you give them more money. This is more money on this axis, and this is more utility, or say more joy on this axis. So as you give them more money, their joy increases, but then it sort of levels off after a period of time. Okay? For the risk-neutral individual, their joy is exactly this way. For the risk-loving person, their utility happens to go like in this. This is the shape of the utility function. Okay? So what's happening here is basically that the expected utility. So let's say you said I would either get $0 or $100. In the middle is what I you know, I would sort of be my expected utility if I were to get the $50, which is sort of the mathematical equivalent. But my actual utility from the $50 with receiving of certainty is higher than that. So the reason all of us buy insurance is for this reason. You know, the certainty that if I put my car into an accident, I'll get it fully paid for is that utility is higher for me than taking a chance that most of the time I'm, I'm not going to be in an accident and then some chance that I will be in an accident and I incur that loss, okay? So this is the method that is now used to look at the value of interventions, including vaccination, because vaccination, if you think of it, is insurance. Wouldn't you agree? Vaccination is insurance. You take the vaccine in advance and then you're saying, I don't have to worry about COVID. I don't have to worry about measles, whatever it is. So you can use the same thought process that you're using for buying car insurance or burglary insurance or fire insurance for vaccines as well. Remember, it's a different method than cost effectiveness because here you're not buying health for the money, although that's also part of it. You're buying peace of mind for the money. Okay. So this is the method that is now used. Uh, you know, the, the first paper that we wrote on this was, I don't know, back in 2014 or something. And this was the, sorry, this was the, how do I go back? Um, th this was sort of the example that we used of tuberculosis. And we looked at income quintiles. So everyone is familiar with quintiles, the poorest 20%, and then this is the richest 20%. And you say, look at the TB debts averted. 
Obviously, most of the debts are going to be averted in the poorest quintiles and almost nothing in the richest quintiles. And you're crowding out private expenditures as well because, you know, people would pay privately. Um, and depending on the kind of health care sector you have in your country, uh, you know, you're going to crowd out some amount of, 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 of um, uh, out-of-pocket expenditure. But you see the insurance value is highest for the poor because when you're poor, you don't want to take a chance with being wiped out. Let's say you have a lot of money. It doesn't matter if you're off work for, you know, a year because you have savings to fall back on, you're fine. If you're poor, one day of not working is what puts you under. So you're you're actually very risk averse if you're poor. You're sort of in between if you're sort of middle class. And then you're not so risk averse if you're wealthy because you can afford to lose the money, right? So when you put it this way, then you really see the value of vaccination or TB interventions, and especially with the distributional consequence, which we care about. We care about equity, right? So we care about not just the average insurance value. We care about the insurance value by every single um, quintile. So we've done this now. So you can look at what is now called the money metric value of insurance and per capita income as it goes up. And the many money metric value of insurance is highest actually for the poorest. Okay. So this has now been done for other, you know, this is a very nice paper which does this for, uh, for uh, DPT, uh, uh, so DPT level coverage for rotavirus. So we're looking at rotavirus deaths averted for a million birth cohort. And this study compared India and Ethiopia these are going from poorest to richest quintiles. Obviously, the burden of disease is highest over here. So you're going to get the maximum rotavirus deaths averted over here. But here you see that the money metric value of insurance for a million birth cohort is kind of different between India and Ethiopia. You see, for instance, in Ethiopia, it's highest for the highest, the wealthiest people, but not so much for the poorest compared to India, where it sort of is going down. The reason for this is because Health seeking behavior or the ability to actually get health care when you're poor and pay out of pocket is an option for people who are poor in India. In Ethiopia, the unavailability of health, you know, uh, of, of just uh, places to even go spend your money and to fall into financial impoverishment is much less in Ethiopia. So in some sense, the insurance value is not as high in Ethiopia as it is in India. Right. And whereas the rich in, in Ethiopia have a lot of access, they pay a lot of money. And for them, this monetary value of insurance is actually quite high. Now, there's private expenditures that are crowded out, which means you're sort of, you know, preventing people from having to pay out of pocket for this, which is not very different. It depends on how much people are spending already in India and Ethiopia. And like I just said, people in Ethiopia are not spending that much. People, even the poor in India, are spending a lot of money on road virus. And there's a net private expenditure that's averted. And you can then look at the net private expenditures averted with rotavirus as a function of vaccine price as well. So I'm not going to get into the details, but just to say that this field is really now quite vast, that you can now play around with vaccine price and then also look at the kind of information that policymakers want to have. This is the kind of study that we presented in India to the NITAG group before India introduced the rotavirus vaccine to also not just look at overall cost effectiveness, but also look at what the distributional consequences are. Because people want to know, you know, are you really benefiting the poor? If one vaccine is going to benefit the rich and the other one's going to benefit the poor, you know, you want to make that trade off in the appropriate way. So this can be done for pneumonia treatment or pneumonia treatment and the pneumococcal vaccine as well. Now, third set of things are around how do you really figure out what the values of the vaccine before you actually roll it out? Because people are different. Their access to healthcare centers is different. Can you simulate the nationwide rollout of a vaccine? And the answer today is yes. Uh, what we have is these very complex models. I should have spelled it out. It's called an agent-based model. How many of you are familiar with agent-based models? Okay, one, couple of them. So an agent-based model is very simply uh, what is called an in silico or a model on a computer of the entire population. Now, how can you do that? So basically, if I have a representative population, so in many countries, they have uh, living standard measurement surveys or demographic and health surveys, right? So I can use those data to simulate every individual in that population as an individual inside a computer. And then I can basically figure out what the impact is of a vaccine rollout on them, on their health, on their economic well-being, on their wages, everything, 
But effectively, what you're doing is you're basically simulating what a vaccine rollout is going to look like. Remember, in countries where different states or provinces are very different, you can use this kind of a model to say in this province, it will have a big impact, but in this province, it won't have such a large impact. And we do this, obviously, in India, which is a country with with huge amount of diversity within the country itself. But you can do it for many things. So it requires a lot of data to be sure. So these are very data intensive. They require data on the population, age, sex, socioeconomic characteristics. You need to have information on the disease epidemiology, on health systems, how available the treatment is, what the demand is for treatment and adherence. So that's also important. And uh, that gives us what the death or incidence averted is and then gives you economic outcomes, whether there's cost effectiveness or out-of-pocket expenditures or distribution aspects. So there's, you know, in this particular model, you know, it's a pneumococcal study. So we're looking at multiple stereotypes. Uh, we cross immunity, individual behaviors. And then we built this model called India Sim, which we've now used for something like 15 different diseases. So it's not just for infectious disease. You can use it for many different things. But what it has is a population structure, uh, which is parameterized to the actual data. So it really looks like the real country, right? And you don't have to roll out the vaccine to simulate this. You can do this and figure out how to do, uh, you know, figure out what the impact is going to be. So we looked at two things. We looked at vaccination infection on rotavirus and then pneumococcal and looked at regular vaccination and what the cost effectiveness would be of expansion. Uh, this was one study which looked at, uh, like I said, of the rotavirus vaccine. Uh, and what you're able to do just to get to the results are you have a baseline of DPT and measles coverage of, you know, this is the amount of coverage at the time we did the study. You have an intervention where I'm assuming the rotavirus vaccine is at the DPT level. Uh, second intervention, I'm assuming I'm able to get it to 90% coverage. And then the third, I'm able to get a 90% coverage, not average across the country, but targeted by state. And you can see that, you know, I can get very precise results on, uh, you know, after I get to my under five immunization coverage, what my total deaths under five are averted. So this is not just about economics. It's about modeling, you know, health impacts as well. I can look at what the health and financial impacts also are, um, uh, whether it's in dallies averted from the baseline or incremental cost on the baseline or the out-of-pocket expenditures averted. And you can see in the very bottom, I can see that for the rotavirus vaccine, my biggest impacts are in states like Uttar Pradesh in the north, which has a lot of rotavirus, but also, you know, pretty poor and a lot of out-of-pocket expenditures associated with rotavirus, but also second come in. Uh, Madhya Pradesh and, and Rajasthan, which are out there. Uh, and then I can also do that money metric value of insurance that, that I just spoke about. Uh, and I can do it by, by state. So we can do this also for, uh, so that was rotavirus. This is the pneumococcal analysis. Again, you can do fairly sophisticated stuff, which also looks at, uh, um, at decline in, in, uh, in disease by serotype through an intervention like this, if you have a strong enough disease model. So, and then you can also look at 20 year outcomes and the value cost per 100,000 found the fives. My last point is going to be about the broader benefits of vaccines. The broader benefits of vaccines, so sorry to go back. This, this actually, this picture is actually from Matus who's sitting at the back there. Um, and this is part of a study that will soon come out, right, Matus, on, on the value of vaccines. And of this, AMR is one of them, but there's morbidity, there's economic burden, there's all sorts of other things. And, uh, we don't often measure these value vaccines. So in a set of studies that have been coming out over the last 10 years, we look at, uh, at the fact that vaccinated kids have better cognitive abilities. They miss school less, are in school for longer, better nutrition and education outcomes. We don't have good numbers on these, but today we do. Uh, and we have now used these to be able to figure these numbers out by state. I'm showing a lot of India data because that's where most of my studies are, but we do them for Africa as well. And you can do this based on when the immunization program is rolled out in India. You can see, for instance, that the immunization program in India was associated with 0.2 to 0.3 additional school grades, 6 to 14% higher weekly wages, and then 2% lower demand for children. Why? Because people feel like they have to have fewer children if there's a higher chance of kids surviving. Um, you can look at, uh, uh, so for instance, by vaccine. So the measles vaccine was linked to improved anthropometric Z scores, um, standardized test scores, and also schooling grades in four countries. A hip vaccine similarly improves school grades as well as uh, test scores. Now, the last point, very last point is really on antibiotic resistance, which is what I really work on. 
And here, vaccination is a very, very important intervention. You have fewer infections, you have lower disease burden, and then you have lower antibiotic use as well. Uh, it's probably one of the best interventions we have against antibiotic resistance. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, vaccines directly target resistance strains. So PCV actually specifically targets resistance strains of uh, strep pneumonia. And I'm sure you'll hear about this this afternoon. Uh, and the introduction of PCV7 actually reduced both susceptible disease and non-susceptible disease. Uh, these were data from the United States. You see this kind of uh, picture everywhere else. So vaccines can be a very important way in which you deal with AMR. Uh, and not just dealing with AMR, you also are reducing antibiotic consumption. So antibiotic prescriptions attributable to acute urine infections decreased almost 42% after PCV7 was introduced. So you're reducing out-of-pocket expenditures, but also related to, to uh, uh, drug-resistant infections as well. So I'm going to skip through these last couple just to say that, uh, you know, there's lots of evidence. You have Ron was at the back. This is his study on on PCB vaccinated kids requiring antibiotics for 17% fewer days in Israel, you see that kind of effect in other places as well. Um, and it's not just about bacterial vaccines, viral vaccines are also effective, possibly even more effective. The influenza season is the single most important driver of antibiotic use in the world. The single most important driver. Reducing influenza, seasonal influenza can be probably the best thing we can do to reduce antibiotic consumption. Okay, so uh, again, there have been intervention studies that have now started to come out looking at how much you can you can avert with uh, with vaccination. So the last couple of slides are you can use a broader set of measures to incorporate into what's called benefit cost analysis, which can incorporate a broader set of benefits of vaccination, allows for a dollar for dollar comparison, and there are other methods called a value of statistical life to measure improvements in health and longevity. You don't have to use dallies anymore. So if you're uncomfortable with DALIs, DALIs have some challenges with measurement. We can go directly to just dollar metrics or any currency metric. And these are widely used in other fields like environmental economics. Um, I'm sorry, I did, I did have one last thing to say, which is disease eradication. We talk about vaccination just in terms of a program. But you have to remember that eliminating disease through vaccination has tremendous benefits. You can avoid future infections and future vaccinations. I'll share these slides with you, but you can actually see that the smallpox eradication campaign, the cost of the entire campaign is recouped by the United States every 28 days. Every 28 days, the entire cost of the program comes back. Why? Because of not having to vaccinate against smallpox. So you have these much longer benefits also with disease eradication programs, which are typically possible only through vaccination. So a lot of work that's happened through that as well. Um, so just to summarize, to recap, I think economic evaluation shows us how much health we can buy through vaccination compared to alternatives. Um, cost effectiveness is the most straightforward approach, but misses a lot of values like financial risk protection and the value of vaccines. Um, there's methods like extended cost effectiveness, which go beyond uh, the original cost effectiveness, and they can incorporate financial risk protection, but also distributional consequences of, of immunization, uh, you know, and improve equity that way. And finally, I think there are methods uh, which we should be using now, like benefit cost analysis, which capture the broad benefits of vaccines and include impact on wages, economic well-being, antibiotic resistance, and so forth. They do require more information, but that kind of information is more available now than it used to be 10 or 15 years ago. So with that, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions? Questions? Hi, Roman. Good morning. I have a question about DALIs. You know, you've said that they incorporate mortality and morbidity, but I have difficulties in, in confidently using them because we often don't know, you know, what pathogen, what type of morbidity does a particular pathogen cause? You know, when I look at DALIs from IHME for Shigella, I don't know whether that contains stunting or wasting or whether I look at RSV DALIs, I don't know whether that contains, you know, wheezing and asthma. So how can I better understand what is the exact component of that morbidity if we as scientists often don't actually know what, what that is? The, that's a great point. The, the only honest answer is nobody really knows. These are numbers that, uh, that Chris did when he was at WHO. There's a fat book which has these disability weights. Um, you know, they presumably get, well, not presumably, they get them by asking experts, you know, how much disability is there associated with having one day of malaria versus one day of Shigella or one day of, 
so it's it's all pretty hokey in that way just to put a very scientific term on it uh but it's better than not counting the morbidity but dallies are uh how shall i say a uh, uh they're a challenging metric which is why you know they're not the best metric i think to to use i think that's why in dcp2 we used financial risk protection that's a much more of a that's an understandable metric right so you can you can actually figure out what's going on and it's also consistent with what policy makers want policy makers can't understand dallies either i mean we can't so i'm sure they can't either but money metric financial risk protection they can because that's that's much more straightforward other questions wow okay let's go right here in the third row hi maya from gavi um thank you for that presentation so i'm just wondering how how we uh, translate a lot of this work to country to to lo a lot of the countries that that we work with and they won't often have access to modeling as as amazing as this and what is what is the minimum kind of level of information and data that that they would need in order to to make good decisions you know um i think a lot of data are available and some of this does go into the bis strategy stuff so i i don't know you know the your team that's doing it now but typically they are on top of what the literature is um and the underlying base is stronger for some countries and for other countries it's entirely a function of where those studies actually happened uh but i think things like agent based modeling these sorts of methods are much more feasible now just because we have a lot more data so i think gabby really should look to look at these kinds of benefits and the last time i was on a bis committee which is now a few years ago uh they were considered i mean we were looking at say the value of the verdant antibiotic use for instance where we were able to do that um and i think gabby's appropriate perspective should be this broader benefit of vaccines i think seth has been talking about this for a very long time i had a quote from him as well and in fact that that paper which was quoted from was actually from another meeting we had up the hill on nsc right here in town so um i think you know now that the blockbuster vaccine that can save a lot of under 5 mortality that era is kind of over we've done most of those vaccines any vaccines that we choose to introduce now will have to consider broader benefits because there are just not enough of the child deaths of that kind to have the same impact that we did with with pentavalent or pneumo I mean I think malaria is an exception obviously and if we had a tb vaccine then that would that would be different. I saw a question we'll start in the second the back row yeah okay my turn. Uh good morning uh, I'm Farzana from India. Uh you have mentioned like it is a very good presentation and uh, uh, the like health economics and everything is very tough for me to understand but it was a really very great presentation. Uh my question is according to WHO like to achieve a perfect health is really difficult like it's not just merely of absence of disease so how do you define the health when uh, you the the when you calculate the cost effectiveness so great question in in that definition of cost effectiveness is just the absence of of disease which is obviously only a partial measure and that is precisely why cost effectiveness is the kind of way in which economic evaluations used to happen a while back and still happens for many things it's not like it's not carried out now but i wanted to give you an appreciation for what it can do it's very simple but what it can't do which is it's not very sophisticated um it doesn't capture a lot of the things that we care about when we want to introduce a vaccine and i think you heard that in analysis presentation as well it's the same idea which is vaccine efficacy alone is a very partial measure of what you really care about Uh, yeah thank you i'm santosh with who i just had a question maybe from a country perspective in terms of um, i know this cost effectiveness is always taken into consideration while for the routine vaccines right but um is this also really i mean like during the covid-19 and more of an emergency setting right like i think countries were drafting plans but this was not never a topic of a discussion so how do you kind of compensate that into this in a, in a more in an emergency setting you know? You know great question in an emergency setting what they remember that everything that we do we're making an economic evaluation whether you realize it or not right you're making a risk evaluation all the time how many of you ever crossed a road when there's a red light saying do not cross why do you do it 
what what are you what are you really evaluating in your mind even though you're not actually doing it there's no risk or you're saying there's a very low risk and there's a benefit because i'll get to wherever i want to a little faster would you do it in in hanoi no because the risk is at least perceived risk is quite high although i've discovered it's actually quite safe to do it if you do it carefully <laughs> but if you don't know how to do it then you're perceiving a risk what is happening in the case of covid is that people are making that same kind of calculation which is they implicitly saying this vaccine is going to help me bring the economy back it's going to help me you know prevent the lockdowns it's they they imputing a lot of values in their mind all that this does is provide a structure for that imputation which sometimes you can go wrong by just relying on your gut we all rely on our gut for cost effectiveness we do this all the time we're buying stuff you know you're deciding do i want to buy a safer car do i want to buy a volvo do i want to buy you know in india you have a car called a tata nano which is very cheap but you never want to be in a crash on that car so you're making that calculation all the time policy makers also make that calculation but putting a structure on it really makes it explicit and tells you where your intuition is going wrong any other questions yes there um uh, talking about intuition going wrong um i think in a lot of high income countries we struggle with balancing preventive um expenditure with <laughs> uh with curative care uh, where if you want to treat a disease that's already manifesting the sky is the limit it seems where but for prevention you need to have a super strong case um i think that's uh goes against the, if you formalize how much health you're you're buying for a dollar spent um and i think a lot of people know it but still it seems we're not really uh, able to change the paradigm so do you have any uh, any advice <laughs> you know this is this is partly psychological because obviously we all want to treat something that's obviously out there rather than prevent i mean this is why are parents of children under the age of 1 so happy to give their kids antibiotics even though it has lots of side effects and are vaccine hesitant even though the risk of vaccines is far lower than that of antibiotics you know for the same reason there's something that's actually bad and you feel like you're responding to that situation so there's some amount of human psychology that's involved in there and that's true for policy makers as well but that's why putting it into strong metrics like this and getting the conversation beyond just the health to say it's it reduces poverty it improves well being it's good for your you know wages uh, you know we have uh, uh, you know we have good evidence on numbers of years of schooling and kids who are vaccinated versus not those are outcomes that people care about and treatment doesn't buy you that same kind of thing this is only immunization that buys you all of those benefits that's why we need to go beyond just this you know thinking of vaccines as buying tomatoes in a supermarket to really think about what they're getting for you there's been no questions on this side of the room so this is your last chance for <laughs> i go okay there you go uh thank you i am wait from baksa uh i have a question regarding the dcp3 as you know that dcp3 is much needed to achieve uh, universal health coverage in, mm -hmm. uh, in countries so uh, which method will be uh, best method either we have to promote the health insurance program in the country or we have to establish public health sector uh, uh, health settings uh, at primary secondary uh, and tertiary level and as far as the vaccine are concerned uh that are totally provided through the uh, public sector the uh, settings and if we promote the insurance uh, perspective uh we involve the private settings and the role of private setting in vaccination is very low hmm. well i think public health programs like vaccination should be done through improved public health because public health uh, or investing in that is really what provides equity and access you're going to be able to provide it in the most remote parts of the country so in that sense it's a no brainer in fact most developed countries use that method the only exceptions to that are switzerland to some extent and the united states also to to some extent although um, you know it's not true in the us for people above the age of 65 who who, who do have uh, you know much more access that way so i think the idea of universal health coverage was this idea that we need to invest in delivery of public health because it benefits a population at large and insurance has some you know some some big disadvantages with it i won't get into it now but but really uh um it it's it's a good stopgap in some cases 
to prevent the financial risks, uh, impoverishment. But it's not the most efficient way of providing health. Providing health is best done in the way, I mean, if you think about it, there are lots of problems with the National Health Service in the UK, but that's really the kind of system that most countries should aspire to.